and I'll start with you, um, and I'm going to say Agnes. Yes. I'll start with you. <laughs> Today, some 100 million of the farmers across Sub-Saharan Africa farm less than two hectares of land. Some 80% of those living in rural areas are poor. More than 30% of the rural population is chronically hungry, and 35% of the, of the under five-year-olds are stunted. By 2050, the bulk of the world's population growth will take place on the continent. In fact, some project that 1.3 billion will be added to the continent, and Nigeria will grow larger than the size of the United States between now and 2050. Despite those numbers, projections, the economic projections suggest the Sub-Saharan African agriculture market alone will top a trillion U.S. dollars by 2030s. So my question to you uh, is, is this projection achievable? If so, what role will AGRA play in making it a reality for the continent? Thank you, uh, Ethan, and thank you, Jeff and Rose, Rose for, for having us here. Uh, so to the question that you're asking, I just wanted to start by looking back at my own life growing up on a farm, two hectares. Because actually, if it wasn't two hectares, it would be like weird to me, because that's what I grew up seeing. Most farmers I know had two hectares. I think the most important thing is not the two hectares, it's how you turn those farmers into viable farmers. Because most, most of African farmers are going to be 70%, 80% of African farmers are going to be two hectare type of farmers. So when Agra was formed in 2006, which actually what the a year later in 2007, I joined the Ministry of Agriculture as, as permanent secretary, the ability of a farmer, an African farmer at that time, to find seed anywhere was next to impossible. I mean, I don't remember like any farmer would get seeds anywhere in the next 50 kilometers, say. Um, Joe, who is here, who was at the beginning of that whole journey, tells you there were 10 seed companies on the whole continent producing less than 2,000 metric tons. Today, we have over 110 seed companies producing um, thousands of metric tons that is capable of growing 10 million hectares, capable of reaching over 15, 15 million farmers. So based on that alone, the ability to close the yield gap, farmers have actually moved from 0 0.5 tons of hect per hectare of maize when we are growing something called katumani, I don't know if you know katumani, <laughs> to now something like 1.6, we've tripled. But just even at that point, the gap is enormous. We, we need to get to four tons because you know what? A, a Rwandan farm at three tons will be able to compete in, in terms of price with international markets. Right now, a, a farmer producing 1.5 tons per hectare cannot compete price-wise. So the, the fact that the opportunities are beginning to form, the fact that the Agra has worked with the uh, uh, number in 18 countries across the continent to produce over 650 varieties that are available within 10, a distance of 10, 10 kilometers now, from over 100 kilometers to a distance of 10 kilometers, through uh, retail shops known as agro dealerships that, are, that are, are scattered around the continent, the opportunity is beginning to form that actually African farmers can feed themselves and actually can form businesses out of agriculture. The next thing I wanted to say is private sector, existence of private sector. When I became Minister of Agriculture in Rwanda, my biggest frustration was the fact that there was no private sector in the agriculture sector. It's like you're, tr you're trying, in, 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 in people say that in the public sector we have a repulsion <laughs> against private sector, but here you wish for it and there's nowhere to find private sector. So we had to grow it from scratch. So governments are beginning to understand the value of private sector and are thinking through how to grow private sector putting the right policies in place. A number of African governments are working now with the World Bank on the ease of doing business so that they can help build the private sector. So that's beginning to take shape. Uh, one other thing now, which actually we are working on now as AGRA, is 
public capacity to drive implementation and delivery, which is one of the biggest weaknesses now. I mean, Agra as an institution can only do so much, mm -hmm. but these governments have the potential and the capacity to reach every corner of their countries. Mm -hmm. The problem is they are challenged by capacity to, to, to do that, by capacity to design proper programs, and by capacity to implement these programs. A few countries are beginning to do that, and we have a few examples, with Ethiopia, Rwanda, Burkina Faso, you see a few countries around the continent that have begun to figure it out. And we are learning from those countries and using those examples to support other countries to actually come up with policies and, 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 and models that will allow them to implement. I mean, here in the discussion we had in the morning, people are talking about the type of policies and how you build a policy environment that will allow delivery. So it's, it's on everybody's mind. So I have no reason to... to, to to question that our, with all of us putting together, we, we can deliver on this. Mm -hmm. This is something that is achievable. Okay. So with investing in smallholder farmers to make them turn them into businesses, increasing access to seeds, um, the private sector, and building the capacity of the public. So I'll turn to you, Kanael. You've heard what, what Agnes has said. Over the past decade, as EFED's president, you led the global response to the challenges and opportunities for agricultural development, particularly in rural areas. And, but, and as we said, specifically with smallholder farmers, focusing on smallholder farmers. With the projected population growth on the African continent and the expansion of the number of urban areas into megacities, is, is there an ideal agricult African agriculture system of the future that will help us achieve these goals? And if so, what does that system look like? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Etheraid, and thanks again, uh, Jeff, and, uh, for this uh, opportunity to share with you my thoughts. Of Etheraid, I, I, I don't believe there's an ideal agricultural system for Africa, or for African countries, to be more correct. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I can turn your question around, what, what does Africa need to do to turn its agriculture around in order to meet the challenges of future, of, of the projected doubling of its population, to meet the challenges of, fu of, of food security? And I will start off from what Agnes has just said. First, of course, is for us to see agriculture, no matter what size or scale, as business. That's crucial to go from the subsistence level and to stop seeing poverty, to, to, to stop romanticizing poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, poverty is man-made, it's not natural. So uh, when you look at the African continent, uh, one thing that has been very clear to me is that Africa is, by no means, Africa is by no means poor. In fact, Africa is very, very rich. Mineral wealth from diamonds, to bauxite, uh, the percentages are incre incredible. 15% of all reserves. Uh, land, about 50 to 60% of all uncultivated agricultural land, 200 million hectares. Uh, excess of sunshine, plenty of rainfall, kilometers of waterways, I mean, you name it. And a vibrant population, 60% of its youth below the age of 30. <coughs> what other part of the world has this sort of, and we don't have earthquakes <laughs> and typhoons <laughs> and hurricanes, <laughs> and you name it. So I think the Africa, no country in the world ever transformed itself without going through an agrarian change. Mm -hmm. No country. Europe, 17th century, Japan, 18th century, 19th century, US, <laughs> your country, China, 20th century. Now why should it be different from Africa? So first and foremost, you have to have a total agricultural transformation. But Agnes already gave the ingredients. Seed, fertilizer, irrigation. But I think the key problem that we face is the policy dimension. And that is all linked with governance and leadership. Mm -hmm. That's going to be our biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. If we have that corrected, and you have the rule of law, 
then Africa's agricultural transformation is going to be such where small producers today become aggregated. They have to be aggregated into cooperatives and SMEs and companies, and you have to have the whole value chain. And if you ask myself, if you ask, if you ask yourself, in the, by 2050, who is going to feed Africa? Is it the farmers of today in their 60s? A woman with a hoe in her hand and a baby on her back? I think that's what you have up there, isn't it? <laughs> no, it's the youth of today. But they're not going to be using the same technologies that exist today. Just think of what IT can do. Aggregation, organization of farmers groups. So the elements are there. I see the, I see the agriculture of tomorrow meeting the challenge, I mean, for Africa meeting that challenge is Africa become, being at the forefront of feeding the world. Africa has to be able to feed itself first. And we have all the opportunities there. If we don't do that, I mean, if it's not gonna happen in my generation. I think my generation has failed. In fact, what my generation has done successfully is to fail, failure. <laughs> and we're out of it. It's the future, not even my own children, my grandchildren perhaps, or my great-grandchildren. They are the ones to bring about this change. So I see huge potential in transforming African agriculture. First, it's got to be built on what we have, small producers, but to see it as business, as a money-making business, as an economic activity that generates wealth, mm -hmm. creates jobs, feeds people, and brings about the emergence of cohesive societies. Mm -hmm. And until we do that, and until we're able to manage our resources properly, until we have the right leadership and correct governance structures and institutions that function correctly, I think that's what we're going to be looking at in the next century. Mm -hmm. Well, you just made me very uh, sad because I've been saying to the world that we were going to do this in my lifetime. <laughs> uh, but creating wealth, jobs, focusing on people, all of the, the ingredients that, that we've heard you talk about before. But the one issue, and I'll go to Raj on this, that we haven't talked about is how do we finance this work uh, that is necessary. And the Rockefeller Foundation not only provides financial support to AGRA, but for a large number of other organizations and projects around the entire sub-Saharan continent. So Raj, I'd ask, what do you see as the hurdle or hurdles to scaling from direct development programs to creating the kinds of systems and structural changes that uh, both Agnes and Kanayal has talked about? And how can foundations and other donors um, or help us help those who are working in these areas overcome those hurdles? Well, well, thank you. I, you know, I think Agnes and Kanaya both laid out the groundwork. First, you have to have a goal, and the goal of achieving four tons per hectare of, call it maize yields in Africa, if achieved, uh, would be a tremendous step forward in both food self-sufficiency, but also in fighting hunger and chronic malnutrition. And uh, I won't get into all the data substantiating that, but. You know, it is true that a dollar spent in agricultural research yields $23 of real value to those smallholder farm families. It is true that every society, as Kanayo mentioned, that's achieved rapid economic development and social mobility has done it based on a fundamental agricultural transformation where those yield increases are coupled with a population decrease of people working in agriculture, right? It's very, very small percentage here <coughs> in the United States that are actually farming. Uh, and, and allowing people to go into other productive sectors of the economy. And that's really what success looks like. The fact that Agra has gone from 0 0.5 tons per hectare to 1.6 is a demonstration that can be achieved. Mm -hmm. The fact that uh, the seed program at Agra has produced more than 150 improved varieties and put them out in the field, supported more than 110 seed companies and built the system of hundreds of agro dealerships that allows uh, farmers to interact with a commercial market for both inputs and, and output sales is laying the groundwork for success. But it starts with having a clear goal, mm -hmm. knowing how to measure it, and documenting outcomes. And Agra has done that, I think, quite rigorously over its 11-year mm -hmm. uh, institutional life. I'd say second is what Kanayo mentioned, which is you, you have to, like we talk about money until we're blue in the face. 
that's not going to solve the problem if the policies are in the way. And uh, the chairman of Agra, Strive Masiwa is here, but Strive played a big role in the 2012 uh, G8 summit, which you, Earth, were a big part of as well. <laughs> when, we, when we said, okay, donors can do more and will do more, in that case, President Obama used the G8 to get, uh, to get folks, to, to get other countries to say, let's increase our investments in agricultural development in Africa. But it started with African heads of state at a head of state level committing to a concrete and specific set of policy reforms uh, that we had to hammer out as a precondition to being able to come to that meeting. And I, I remember uh, it, at the end, some worked better than others, to be honest. But I do remember just putting in the time of sitting with leaders and saying, are, will you commit to these policy reforms? And folks saying, some saying, yes, we will. Others saying, no, we won't do the number 11 and number 12. But it's that level of policy engagement to ensure that the groundwork exists for real private investment in agriculture, real commercialization of the ag sector, mm -hmm. real access to these improved seed varieties. And, uh, and Agra is now doing that as part of its the grand new strategy going forward that I hope Agnes can tell us about in 11, in 11 African countries. And then finally, after those two pieces are in place, it takes resources. And uh, you know, in the 60s and 70s, when, when the world made a huge collective investment in agriculture in Asia and Latin America, for example, uh, it succeeded at, at, do, at, at promoting a green revolution that changed the face of hunger and poverty. Uh, in the 1860s, in the midst of a civil war, when Abraham Lincoln signed the Morrill Act and made a huge public <laughs> investment in land-grant universities and American ag extension in this country, it, over 50 years, transformed the face of our agriculture and made us the most productive staple grain economy in, in the world. So. Uh, resources are required, and the truth is, in the 70s and then, and really in the 80s, and by the time we got to the 1990s, uh, the level of public investment in agriculture had just disappeared mm -hmm. completely. Uh, the only reason I think we're here today is in 2003, Kofi Annan brought together heads of state in Maputo, and African heads of state started the process by saying, uh, with a lot of cajoling and support <laughs> from folks, in this room that we're going to spend 15% of our public budgets on agriculture. Mm -hmm. Without that kind of commitment, I don't think any of this would have happened. Mm -hmm. Then in 2005, uh, six, uh, Dr. Roden was leading the Rockefeller Foundation and, and Gates and Rockefeller came together and I think did an extraordinary thing in helping to create this institution of, of AGRA as a, as a technical institution focused on this problem. In 2009, President Obama, with the, you're doing a lot of the shoe leather work, you know, raised $20 billion in commitments through the L'Aquila Summit because we said there's a global financial crisis. We're going to spend hundreds of billions of dollars bailing out the, the financial system. What about those who are suffering from a food crisis? And you'll remember, in 2008, we were looking at pictures. The cover of The Economist had a photo of a little girl in Haiti mm -hmm. eating a mud cake, mm -hmm. which is exactly what it sounds like because of a food price crisis uh, that, uh, <laughs> that many in this room worked on mm -hmm. and, and led to that political motivation. So what's happened since? There's been an increase in public investment in agriculture. That's a good thing. Uh, I'm deeply concerned about the fact that I think European donors and the United States are uh, decreasing their overall foreign <coughs> assistance commitments, redirecting the limited amount of money we spent on, on helping countries stand on their own two feet and be productive and integrated in a global economy, we've taken a meat cleaver to that in mm -hmm. this country with, with the current administration proposing 30, 40 percent cuts. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, because AGRA is proven it's a result-oriented institution, uh, it has survived mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. and, in fact, yeah. garnered even greater investment from the public sector. But uh, but we have to change the larger, broader trend mm -hmm. around foreign aid and foreign assistance to continue uh, the progress I think we've seen and that we hope for. Mm -hmm. Well, clear goals, policy development, and then resources. Um, and so you talked about uh, the investment that Rockefeller and Gates made, and I talked about your work there. We can't forget about Jeff being at the Gates Foundation then too, because it was his leadership 
that uh, ensure that we have the resources that were necessary. Yeah, in fact, I got a lot of my practical training in farming on the, on the Rakes farm. Uh, so I, I feel like I earned my right to be here. <laughs> Hard work. So, so Usha, let me, let me turn to you because you're a sex successful uh, Indian business operator. Um, and your company is now pursuing opportunities on the African continent. Um, and we've heard what the, the, the three panelists have talked about, of what's necessary. What we haven't talked about are public-private partnerships. And uh, the, the, can you talk a bit about the role of public-private partnerships in creating food systems in, across sub-Saharan Africa? And, and how do we move from simply talking about public-private partnerships to creating the ones that really work? And give us, from your experience in India, what you think we can learn to help leapfrog the challenges that you saw in developing those partnerships as we create the ones that will work on for sustain sustainable food systems on the continent. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Jeff and Stanford University for hosting us here. Um, I'll start with the um, partnership which really worked well in India and parts of Asia. And uh, very happy to be sitting next to Raj because I actually wouldn't be here if it wasn't because of the Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation coming to India in the 60s and promoting partnership with the government of India, with private sector, with entrepreneurs to promote good quality planting material. And as a consequence of that, the inputs from the scientific um, community in the United States primarily mm -hmm. um, led to adoption of high-yielding varieties in sorghum. Um, everyone talks about rice and wheat, but actually it was not just rice and wheat, but it was the mm -hmm. sorghum, the millets, the corn mm -hmm. in the central and southern part of the country, which led to the overall uh, agricultural revolution that we see. So um, this is... Uh, and you, you know, all the equation is right for Africa as well. The partners are together. Um, but uh, to me, um, we have done a lot of talking about public-private partnership and not so much on the ground on implementing it in a manner which happened in Asia, for instance, where there was policy mm -hmm. and most importantly, government will. Mm -hmm. The government was mm -hmm. willing to do whatever it took to make sure that agriculture was transformed at the end of it. Um, so a, a partnership is critical for success, but I think partnership today, we have to look at it from a, on a crop by crop basis because in maize, the partnership would look very different because there's so many players. In sugarcane, the partnership would look different. So I wanna use the example of sugarcane, for instance, I know it's not a big crop, but still. So when I think about partners for sugarcane, I wanna talk about irrigation partners mm -hmm. because it uses so much water. So can I partner with a drip irrigation uh, or irrigation specialist uh, who could be public, who could be private, who then allow us uh, to uh, grow the same amount of sugarcane but with less water. So this could be a new form of partnership. Then you still need the partnership where uh, farmers have some assurance about markets uh, availability. It could be a government partnership. It could be so I think uh, talking about public-private partnership to me, uh, maybe, but partnership, yes, definitely. And we need to look at for which crop, what is the critical requirement? Mm -hmm. And depending on that, we think about who the right partners are to get it done. Mm -hmm. And that's great. The policy and having governments with the, po the will to make the partnerships work is I think an important uh, factor um, which takes me right back to you, uh, Agnes, because you, each one of you talked a bit about policies in government and the role of government. Um, so often on the continent, the challenge is governance. And we can't talk about it as a continent. We have to talk about it as countries. And in many of the countries where agricultural opportunities exist, there we have governance challenges. So am I right about that? Do you agree? And if so, what role does AGRA perform in helping countries over overcome those governance challenges? Mm. Yeah, thank you. Just to pick up from uh, what Usha is saying, India became successful because of two things. 
there was a prime minister that was ready, said, actually, I think Indian revolution bega began in front of the office of the prime minister. She pl is he, he, pl he planted the seed right there, saw it grow, and said, I want it everywhere. So the leadership was very critical. Now, the reason Agro was created as an institution that looks across the continent was recognizing that Africa's leadership is going to be challenging. There are so many countries, there's no one leader that is going to say, let's take it to the farm. You're going to have 101 leaders that are thinking differently. So Agra tries to bring the, the idea that technologies are very critical, but also the fact that technologies need the right policies like uh, uh, President Kanai was saying, to be able to take them to the farmer. And those policies are very challenging to build. It's, you have to have the capacity to do a policy like the discussions we had in the morning. Now, the key challenge we find across the continent is the capacity to build the policies to support mm -hmm. an environment of technology delivery to the farmer. Because right now, we find that some of the things the people are dealing with are very basic. The lack of a regulatory environment, which makes it very difficult for private sector to be in a place. The lack of a regulatory environment, which makes it very difficult for, for farmers not to have fake seed. You know, the idea of fake seed is like becoming a huge bu business, or fake fertilizers is becoming a huge business. So uh, Agra is, is, what we are trying to do is trying to understand what did other countries do differently, where we've seen successful green revolutions. In fact, as recent as, as, as China, for example, uh, what, what are they doing differently? Whether it come, it's all the way from land and land policy issues that make farmers commit differently when they're engaging in agriculture. Uh, whether it is access to financial issues and the kind of tools that are put in place to make it possible for women farmers to access finance. Uh, whether it is um, uh, the, the, the whole thing I talked about, private sector. So we see that all these challenges need specific policy tools and what we are trying to do is to work with the governments to understand how to build a policy environment, but also to work with other stakeholders to advocate for that policy environment to take effect. Now, but from a governance perspective, we are working with countries to actually take on CADAP, plan properly. But a plan is not good enough if a plan is not pri prioritized in an environment where you have restricted resources. So we are trying to tell our countries prioritize your plans, be very clear of the two things that are very critical to you driving a successful agriculture sector. That's what we did in Rwanda. We didn't try to drive everything. We picked two, three things that contributed about 60% to our, our GDP and we were able to move. So that's what we are telling countries. Prioritize, put in place your implementation uh, mechanisms that help you deliver and be accountable because you're using other people's resources. You have to tell them where their money is going. You have to show them the results. So, and you, you're building a base that will allow you to pull in your own resources. Mm -hmm. So unless we do these things and really try to go the extra mile, we'll not be able to, agriculture will not transform, and the next economies will not be able to transform. By doing that in Rwanda, we are actually able to reduce poverty by 20% in a period of six years, just by investing, in a rigorous investing in the agricultural sector, doing what the CADAP required us to do. Now, what we are trying to do from a continental perspective is actually taking that to the continent. We are, Raj, we are, <laughs> you will be happy to know that we are actually trying to work with BMGF and others and African Union to actually get a scorecard in the agricultural sector working and start asking ourselves, so, Mr. Your Excellency, if, if you don't know what to do, there's help. Agra can help, so and so can help, there's help, but let's get moving. Mm -hmm. And this is how we track it and this is how we measure it. So with the scorecard, you can see where you're making progress, but also you can see what is difficult for the rest of the continent, for the whole continent. And then Agra knows that it needs to put its weight behind this with, with, with our partners. So I, I think there's a real opportunity uh, using the, the, the energy of one country learning from, uh, from another country through what Agra is doing across the continent to actually be able to get the continent to move at, at, at a different pace than we've done in the past. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I must come back to you on this and ask you though, do you see scorecards made public 
or scorecards just for the government. So the question is, if we're talking about transparency, is it transparency to donors on what they're, how they're scoring on scorecards as well as to the governments themselves? It's interesting that you say that. For me, a scorecard that does not actually track donor investment is not good enough because most of these countries are depending on donor support to get moving. Now, through the Pulse Declaration and everything, we do make commitments. We have to come through on those commitments to support these countries, exactly the point you're making, Raj, mm -hmm. around the fact that, you know, support to agriculture is dwindling. It's, it's, it's up and down. In 2008, we got an up, and we've been going on that. And in fact, last year, in 2016, with your support, Jeff, and, and the rest of the board, we started the Seize the Moment campaign specifically because we are saying this is not the time to let go of supporting African agriculture. And you could see that with uh, all these other commodity crises and everything, everybody was losing interest. And we are saying, no, we cannot let agriculture go down. And, and I think we've managed. Every AGRF, we've been seeing a lot of interest in, in, in keeping the momentum going in agriculture. So, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Kanaya, if I may, come to you. Um, we, Agnes talks about leadership of governments, uh, the regulatory environments, transparency, scorecards. One area she didn't talk about that you talk about in your book, and I will hold up Kanaya's book, uh, yes, I'm, I'm shameless for you. Thank you, you won't do Thank it, I'll you. do it for you, a bucket of water. Uh, is if you want to know about African agriculture, I would suggest you read his book. But let me very go back to the question. And, and the one area she didn't talk about that the governments, you talk about governments, are pursuing uh, to achieve um, sustainable, more sustainable, durable food systems is uh, the issue of uh, innovation. And in your book, you say the most exciting innovations don't always emerge from laboratories. And so what kinds of examples can you give us as a scientist of what role technology and innovation play in achieving this trillion dollar African opportunity, African agriculture opportunity? Thank you. Uh, before, I, before I answer your question, I need to take a, minute, a second. Um, you know, Agnes, I don't believe that African agriculture, the transform transformation of agri African agriculture is dependent on aid. It's, it's not. <laughs> African agriculture will transform itself when leaders invest in agriculture and rural development. And it has to be intrinsic. It's an internal process. De development is not something we do for or to people. Development is something people do for themselves. Our role is to support, to guide, to catalyze, but not to lead, because they must own it. I see the, I see the, I see, I see the role for international development assistance to kickstart, to initiate. But change doesn't come about by itself. It has to be made to happen by those who want to change. And this goes back to governance and leadership as well. They're all interwoven. Mm -hmm. But I want to be clear about that. As I said, no country ever transformed itself on the basis of external aid. We're all scientists, one way or the other. Mm -hmm. A tree, a plant can only grow strong when its roots are fairly anchored in its own soil. Only then can it make use of the energy of the sunlight from air. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And this is very key. <laughs> it's a fundamental process. So having said that, uh, innovation, that is true. I mean, innovation, of course, a lot of innovation occurs in the lab, in Sil Silicon Valley, and of course here in Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, from my experience in Africa, Asia, Latin America, some of these innovations are very simple. Let, let's take the case of fertilizer, fertilizer application. You know, we all say, well, farmers are very poor, they can't afford to use a fertilizer. Fertilizer and irrigation are as old as the Nile civilization. It, 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 is, it is pitiful because the woman that you see up there probably is not part of the five or six, uh, uh, sorry, 13 or 18% of African farmers that use fertilizer. 
compared to 40% in Asia and maybe 60% in uh, Latin America. But look, think, think about in the Sahel where farmers have to apply fertilizer to their millets or sorghum or parts of uh, dry land East Africa. So what did ICRISAT, one of the international centers, the one based in, in India where I spent 18 years of my career, develop the simple bottle cup technology, the application of microdosing fertilizer. Mm -hmm. Now you will say, what has, it, what, are, what has a bottle cap got to do with fertilizer application? It's very simple. No farmers don't have the money to buy a 100 kg fertilizer bag of fertilizer, but they can aggregate and use it. Mm -hmm. Simple bottle cap. Mm. Apply bottle cap fertilizer with the seed to the planting hole. Is that innovation? That's innovation. That is innovation. <laughs> wow. But then take, take another innovation, which, which, which again is also technology-based, but it's used and application. It's a bit different. We partner with Intel to develop small digit, digital equipment for farmers in Asia uh, to measure when to plant, how much fertilizer to apply, or how much irrigation. And a good story we always tell, partnership with Intel my, for my institution, EFAD, was mm -hmm. ability for rice producers to measure salinity or fertilizer application. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, a simple technology that was meant to guide them in the application of fertilizer and the rest of them helped a farmer, a woman in this particular case, like in most cases, a woman, mm -hmm. to reduce her fertilizer application because she had been over fertilizing. Mm -hmm. now, that simple technology can, she can use, or somebody can use and tell her how much fertilizer to apply. So she actually saved money. Mm -hmm. uh, I can give you several others. You know, um, you must have heard the story about the regreening of, of the Sahel. The regreening of the Sahel. And this was a very simple technology of how farmers were able to capture rainfall and to add simple mulching, and they call them in the, in the Sahel. Basically, this started in Niger, in the village of Batodi. Uh, the Milun, the, it's a half moon. It's a half moon structure that you build with, yeah. with rocks and things. And it captures rainwater. It's a small catchment, and you can plant your, your trees and what have you. Mm -hmm. And over 20 years, 25 years, the whole of Batodi, hundreds of acres or hectares of, of, of Sahel dry land was Reforested, mm -hmm. reforestation. Now, this is a very small structure, half moon structure. Not, uh, not only that, they can now add mulch as well as some animal manure and produce vegetables as well. Mm -hmm. Now, is that the innovation? Of course it's innovation. I think basically what we, what we, at least, what I learned in all of this is that innovation doesn't always start in the lab. It actually starts, if you listen to what farmers are doing, or listen to what they're saying. And sometimes it's just taking a very simple idea from the farmers and turning it around and doing it differently. <coughs> innovation is not always something new. And innovation is not necessarily a negation of the past, of what is old. It can basically mean throwing a new light into an old, technology and doing it differently. It's innovation. We get it. <laughs> it doesn't need to be high tech. Even here in Silicon Valley, you can say that and say it proudly. Um, Raj, I want to come to you on a, on a statement that, that uh, uh, Agnes talked about, the need for uh, financial assistance resources. Kanile says, nope, it's not about the aid. Um, <laughs> I would say, but what about investments? And that we need investments in agriculture. And they, in fact, IFPRI, the International Food Policy Research Institute and the International Institute for Sustainable Development issued a joint report recently that said that we will require $11 billion in additional uh, investments to support the achievement of SDG2. They say that six billion of that needs to come from the countries themselves, mm -hmm. but four billion needs to come from outside. Now, here's the challenge. What we're beginning to see is that, for example, you had 
had uh, some of the richest philanthropists come together here in the United States recently and uh, to talk about the investing for the achieving the sustainable development goals, $500 million. And they prioritized um, education, um, the global health, and inequality. Agriculture and food security weren't on that list. We don't have a food crisis like 2009 happening right now that would suggest that we can we have the attention on the front pages. How do we keep agriculture at the top of as a priority for investors and what do we need to do to ensure that agriculture is seen as uh, a, a viable investment? Well, you know, it's obviously difficult, but uh, I think it starts with maybe admitting that it's been the policy environment in many of the countries that uh, everyone here has a lot of experience working mm -hmm. in, has been over the past period of time relatively unstable. Where you, know, where you have a leader and a policy framework that says, okay, we welcome investment, we're going to protect commercial property rights, uh, we're going to invest in the kind of infrastructure that can reduce the in-country transportation of cost-related transportation mm -hmm. of goods like fertilizer in or back haul out and uh, and then there's a change uh, and you know investors are stuck in an environment where that's much less conducive to private investment so I think first and foremost you have to have a set of principles uh, which now have been agreed to as part of Agnes mentioned the CADAP that's the comprehensive African agricultural development <laughs> program right yeah, well. as part of that <laughs> Uh, there are a set of principles on private investment that countries have agreed to that AGRA has supported. Uh, there has to be visibility, like on this scorecard, to making sure people stick with those principles mm -hmm. even as there are leadership changes. And leaders understand the very, very long-term consequences of uh, expropriating land or mm -hmm. the corporate assets and, and private and disrupting uh, property rights in that context. So that's one is policy stability. Mm -hmm. The second, <clears throat> I'm actually is a little bit of a, a slight difference from what uh, Kanaya said, although he's entirely right oh. in his points about <laughs> innovation. <laughs> but some of us, and he was there, of course, were just in this phenomenal presentation about uh, the data and big learning revolution. Mm -hmm. And Thomas Friedman wrote a, a nice piece yesterday or today about Nanda Nilakani and what's happening in India. But it is true that uh, communities in rural African countries that are part of the AGRA program, for example, uh, are already or will soon be data rich before they are financially rich. Hmm. And <clears throat> the, you know, it's, it's uh, something that this community at Stanford and Silicon Valley can do is help all of us understand what that means to accelerate just sheer opportunity, whether it's opportunity for commercial investment, mm -hmm. which is your question, or just opportunity to, to be more efficient at, at the public mission of support for agricultural development. And you know, we've supported at Rockefeller uh, a couple of examples in that area. Like you can, w using that data, you can do a much better job of designing private commercial insurance products for farmers. Mm -hmm. Really, no, no big country has been really successful at an agricultural transition without taking risk out for farmers. And it's a lot to ask farmers to buy all that fertilizer when it might rain, it might not rain, mm -hmm. they might lose their mm -hmm. investment, and there's no public insurance program supporting them. Well, maybe it's the case that, that big data and machine learning will allow us to get so efficient at providing insurance products that either the public subsidy required to put that system in place will go down dramatically, or it can be done on commercial terms as it's being done in some really interesting places uh, around Africa. So that's just one example. Another one's the one we saw that where you all presented that phenomenal information about using satellite data to really map and understand uh, crop yields and performance, and, and it's only a matter of time before aggregating different forms of data allows you to be really predictive in that context, uh, which, which can have big impacts. We already see information technology, the fact that everyone has mobile connectivity, everyone, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa means you can have a different form of uh, pricing systems and, and market pricing systems, access to traders, uh, and, and options that you didn't have 
five or six or seven years ago. So unlocking the data revolution to create commercial opportunities in agriculture, I think will be a big part of the innovation going forward. And we got to take advantage of that too. Well, I'm sorry, I, Raj, I'm not. I'm not saying you're not correct. I mean, I'm you're just totally giving you correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what I was saying, what I was saying, basically, was all innovation yeah. doesn't necessarily have to come from the lab mm -hmm. or from Silicon Valley or from Stanford. There are innovations, <laughs> yeah. no, practical mm -hmm. innovations, which yeah. are just basically ground up. Okay. And we have to. We have to be able. To, we, we should. We should listen to what farmers are saying and what they're doing. And there's mm -hmm. a lot that we can learn from them and then see how we can apply them. Mm -hmm. So we talked a lot about seeds when we talk about, and then I want to talk about this since we're talking about innovation and seeds, and I go back to Usha, because um, you've done a lot of work around seed innovations and at the Maharashtra Hybrid Seeds Company, is in, is, which is one of India's largest seeds company. And it's, it's been reported that the company is planning to move your new technologies, including genetically modified seeds, to, to South Asia and to Africa. And uh, so what role do you believe that uh, GM seeds will play in helping Africa feed itself uh, in the world? And how do you overcome the, 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 the kind of regulatory restrictions that you've seen in India around these issues as you move to bring this technology onto the continent as an innovation to move us forward? I think uh, Raj and Kanayo already talked so much about innovation and I just want to build on that and also talk about very briefly on the GM technology, but talk about innovation and what role from a technical, you know, from a biological standpoint it has had in agriculture and what impact it has had. So uh, as a plant breeder, uh, we're always talking about innovation. So when we, uh, when Jeff grew his first hybrid maize on his farm, corn, uh, it doubled their yields or at least increased them significantly. Now, the question uh, the plant breeder is asking is what innovation is appropriate for which farmer community or which crop? So if we uh, talk about an <coughs> innovation where you go from a variety to a hybrid and it improves uh, productivity, then that is uh, the appropriate innovation for that particular farmer. In some situation, we have used uh, GM technologies uh, which have been appropriate, particularly in cotton and, of course, Africa. Mm -hmm has significant acreage <coughs> under cotton, so that technology would be very appropriate uh, for the continent. And um, I don't think from a safety uh, standpoint, because the safety of that technology is proven in the Americas, in uh, Australia, mm -hmm. and South Africa, Asia. So that really is not a concern. And uh, the, um, the suspicion and resistance that uh, we see for uh, GM technologies uh, is of course real that you uh, you know you have to come up with strategies and approaches to address that but I think in the process what has happened is uh, a general negative environment to a certain extent towards innovation in agriculture which I feel is bad for agriculture for farmers uh, to have the best of technologies why is it that the African farmer and the Indian farmer should not have access to what the American farmer has access to today and reaps benefit from it. And so from that perspective and from a perspective of a plant breeder, we need to really talk about the toolbox. You know, so it's mm -hmm. the hybrids, the varieties, the mm -hmm. uh, GM technology. Tomorrow it'll be the gene edited products. And then uh, after that, we will talk about the satellite based imaging uh, uh, data that we will use for developing drought tolerant crops for that very, very small micro environment that existed in the one district in Nigeria. And so I really want to not focus so much on GM technology, but really <laughs> emphasize on the importance of innovation for agriculture from a science perspective. You know, we have uh, had many uh, examples of the other innovations which also help the farmers, but farmers must have access to the best if they want to get themselves out of their current situation. I love that. Farmers must have access to the best and, and to innovations, to the policies, to the regulatory environment, as well as the resources. Before I go any further, I'd like to open it up to the audience for questions. We are at Stanford. I'm, 
and uh, I know that there are a number of people who are probably chomping. Let me start over here. That's the first hand I saw, and then I'll come over on this side. Go ahead. I'm a senior fellow here at FSI in the Center for International Security and Cooperation and also a professor of African history in the history department. And I would love to hear the panel talk explicitly about three issues, biodiversity, <coughs> food diversity, and climate change, and how these figure into your work. Thank you. Okay, we'll take one other question and then we will go back to the panel. Uh, your hand in the, in the go ahead. Yeah, uh, my name is Kiri. I'm a uh, founder of uh, an organization called Blue Raya. Um, we use uh, solar energy and remote monitoring systems to actually provide access to clean water and irrigation water. Uh, my question is about systemic change because uh, I'm more interested in seeing like the long-term impact on uh, rural populations, people at the bottom level of the, of the pyramid. So uh, to me, I, I think that we need to think in a more holistic way, like taking uh, into account the minimum uh, need, annual income need of a, speci of a given uh, household or population, and then finding the best solutions to actually um, address their issues all over the way so that they reach at least an average annual income that's decent in order to have a decent life. Okay. So my question is, uh, why uh, do governments are not open enough to new approaches that are kind of venture oriented and um, fast moving, which creates a uh, large impact, but requires uh, intensive investment? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Look, why don't we take one more before we go back to the panel? Go ahead. Hi, I'm Timothy Childs. I'm CEO of a company called Treasure 8 and the Future Food Center on Treasure Island. And I want to say, what an amazing panel. I just want to say the fact that the board came all the way to Silicon Valley to have this meeting is a nice signal. And um, welcome to the Bay Area. If enough people haven't said it. Um, I'm, I'm interested about, are there any programs in the new phase that are focusing on creating, uh, transforming the commodity crops into more value-added processed foods um, or uh, pre-processed ingredients that could be tied into entrepreneurialism in the cities and or for export? More value added processing that could be transformed into food? Okay. Perfect. All right. So who wants to start? Uh, we could spend a, another couple hours on here. Let's start with Agnes. <laughs> um, Maybe we start with that very question. And, and in this case, um, I make reference to the, my favorite, the baby food factory in Rwanda mm -hmm. that uh, World Food Program has been, has participated in, you know, um, helping the country come up with a, a way of adding value to food that actually takes value to the farmer because uh, the baby food factory in Rwanda signed up to purchase uh, significant volumes of their food from smallholder farmers following up on the, uh, the Purchase for Progress program that was started by World Food Program. So, so th this company, um, $50 million investment produces uh, million, I mean hundreds of tons of, of baby food to address the issue of malnutrition and purchases maize and, and, and soybean from farmers and these farmers are definitely uh, getting now uh, better prices because they are directly linked. They are directly linked to the factory. They supply the factory. And what the factory did even better, they have access to very affordable finance, something you can, very difficult mm -hmm. to find in, in that part of the world. So they negotiated with, with, um, with, with banks to give farmers that are supplying them very good uh, rates of, of financing so that they can supply. So, so th it's beginning to happen <coughs> in a few places. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I think I think earlier today um, we saw a video of El is it Elsie mm -hmm. from Ghana, mm -hmm. uh, where you know transforming transforming you know cassava into high value crops, mm -hmm. into high value high value products. Sorry. Um, 
I think also this is happening in the, at, at village level. Uh, one, one thing I, I've noticed that in the African context, there hasn't, been, there hasn't been as much progress as you will see in parts of Asia, particularly India, where I lived for 10 years, or in Latin America, mm -hmm. where I saw a lot of transformative processes, co cooperatives, mm -hmm. women's cooperatives, transforming produce, uh, in particular what that impressed me in Bahia is uh, umbu, this part is a, is a, is a, is a, a tree, produces a, uh, the, the, the fruit can be used to make baby food, uh, alcohol as well, <laughs> <laughs> and a few other things. But I, I, I think that the, 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 the opportunities are really huge, and I, what, what Agra is also uh, focusing on is you know, looking at the whole value chain, I think this is very, for Africa, this is going to be very key. And this is where agriculture should be seen by youth, mm -hmm. not just as farming, mm -hmm. as a food system. Mm -hmm. And that, that's where there's a lot of entry points for them, you know, value addition. The simple, the simple value addition of harvesting and storage, mm -hmm. storage. Prolonging the shelf life of fresh produce, for example. And I keep telling young people, see, you can make a lot of money by renting a room and buying a 1.5 kVA generator, like in my country where you have to provide your own electricity. And you can, you can store fresh produce, mangoes or oranges and whatever you have, for a few more weeks past harvest period and release them. Mm -hmm. Then you just clean them up, wash them, put them in plastic bags, mm -hmm. slap a label on it, and there you go. You can add value to that or digital technology, mm -hmm. for example, you know, linking farmers to produce and stuff. So there's a lot of scope for that. And I don't think, we, uh, we really haven't ex explored, uh, ex explored and exploited the potential here in value addition, in transformation mm -hmm. of food, food crops. Um, and also I think uh, in our discussions, we underplay the significance of biodiversity of food diversity and with respect to climate change. Uh, if you look at the old theory of farming systems, you know, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, where crop diversity was very, was very key in terms of ecological balances, and where mixed farming was seen, at that time mixed farming was a practice that was being encouraged, and then uh, farmers were encouraged to go into monocrops, mm -hmm. and now we're going back into you know, into mixed cropping mm -hmm. and, and, and what it does. And especially when you look at village or domestic village gardens or house gardens and what, what the opportunities that it also offers to uh, uh, women farmers. Now, along, along the inland valleys, and this is one ecology that African agriculture is not really exploiting because inland valleys are bound in Africa, practically in every uh, country. And this ecosystem, this ecotype, offers tremendous opportunities for all year cropping, and particularly for vegetables and, and fresh produce. And when you look at climate change, a lot of countries are gonna be affected. High, produ highly productive ecologies are going to become less productive, and you have to look at how you can play on the biodiversity of, of, of systems. Um, the question on systemic, on why are governments not open enough to new it, it, it's not so much as why governments not. Now, Ad, uh, Agnes addressed this issue. I think one of the biggest challenges we have, at least in many African countries, is the lack of, um, what's the word for it, of functional institutions. You know, when you talk about the policy, policy environment, it's not, that, it's, not, it's not that there are no policies. In many places, in many countries, there are policies but you don't have functional institutions to implement and carry forward those policies. And as I said earlier, those policies are just worth the paper upon which, on which they are written. If you don't have institutions, successful countries have successful institutions. If you look at the most progressive countries today in Africa that are making headways in the agricultural sector as well as in IT, they're not the rich countries. They have no mineral deposits. Mm -hmm. Well, they, have, they are not exploiting their mineral deposits. Mm -hmm. The rich countries with a lot of mineral deposits, oil and gas, you name it, the most corrupt, mm -hmm. poor governance, mm -hmm. no, no, I mean rule of law is zero, zilch. Take the case of the successful country, I will give you two of them, Rwanda and Ethiopia. 
based on highly successful agricultural systems with strong institutions, convinced and dedicated leadership, and good governance. It works. So it's not that country, it, it's just basically priorities are wrongly placed. You know, if you look at, I've, if I could just, one second. <laughs> you know, <laughs> now when you look at, no, historically, historically, we should be ashamed of ourselves as Africans. Why? In the 60s and 70s and early 80s, when India was described as a hopeless case, China, a million people died at a, for farming. South Korea was coming out of the war. African countries supported South Korea. We sent aid, both human and financial assistance to South Korea. Not one African country was a net importer of food. Mm -hmm. By 2000, China, India, Brazil, Korea, mm -hmm. sending aid to Africa. Mm -hmm. Why? Our agricultural policies just crumbled. My country discovered oil, so did Gabon and Angola. <laughs> And that was it, the, the Dutch disease. So the whole point here is that there's got to be a total change in mentality. And leadership, not only at the highest political level, but leadership down through the whole fabric of the system. It has to change. Mm -hmm. And that is why I say change only begins from within, not from outside. Mm -hmm. So. You talked about, you touched on climate change and the role that climate change will play in, a, in, a, in achieving uh, the sustainable agriculture systems on the continent. But what role does irrigation play in, in addressing the challenges that uh, climate change is, is, is wreaking on the many parts of the continent? And I'll just I, I, throw I it can, out there. I can talk for an hour, so I'll let somebody else answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I can, I can say something about that. Um, a number of countries on the African continent now are thinking through how to support farmers with technologies through subsidies. And really, the, the bottom line f for these subsidies is recognizing that no farmer will spend their very hard-earned cash on something they don't know. I mean, why would I trust your maize seed better than the maize seed I've dr grown for the last 25 years unless I've seen it perform? So, so these subsidies were started really as a way of extending knowledge to farmers. Now, countries are beginning to recognize that it's seed, seeds and fertilizers are not in, an end in themselves, es especially with climate change that they are going to have to do something to ensure that they secure their water sources. Because the total volume of water remains the same, but the spread is very erratic, that farmers are losing crops anyway. So um, countries have started thinking through not huge scale. Huge scale irrigation schemes are great at a, at a, at a country level, but they are not great at a household level, because not every household has access to that, that scheme. So they are coming up with uh, small-scale irrigation uh, uh, programs that allow farmers to irrigate anything between a quarter and an acre to five hectares. And, and they are putting subsidy programs that support that. And I know that very well because that's the last program I implemented in my country before I, uh, as, as Minister of Agriculture. And, and f farmers will go to the bank to do that, especially if they have a market. So there are a number of things that work together, but securing water in Africa is, because of climate change, is becoming, the f you have to do that. Mm -hmm. And programs to do that are becoming important. And I like what you said in the morning, also about the fact that the sources of water and how we manage them is as critical as, as, as actually making irrigation affordable. But in Africa, nobody thinks about that because we've not had to worry about the amount of water. We've taken, <coughs> it's there, nobody uses it. And you think that that water is always going to be there, except now it's becoming to become, it's beginning to become an issue. So, um, mm -hmm. so we had what I would call a very provocative and thoughtful dialogue with, and you put 
a number of issues on the table that are important to Africa feeding itself, and more importantly to Africa becoming a, a dynamic agriculture uh, system, community, set of communities, set of countries mm. with strong agriculture communities. Um, but one of the things that uh, my colleagues here remind me of often is that you can have a long list, but you need to prioritize. What would you, I'm going to go to give you each one of you a minute to answer this. What were the three priorities you think that uh, governments must consider, investors should think about, as we look to develop the agriculture systems that will help us achieve these goals? Let's start with you, Kanaya. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think, I think um, if, if, if our governments, if our governments or countries recognize that their national, de their national development is highly dependent on a productive and successful agricultural sector, to, feed, to be able to feed themselves, first of all. Then the question is, I mean, I will start from what already exists. Seeds, or, or breeds of cattle, or seeds, varieties, or hybrids, fertilizer, irrigation, and policy. That's now, four. Well, no, no, because, <laughs> no, inputs, <laughs> inputs, <laughs> and they're subdivided into three, <laughs> and policy. But, but you see, I will, I will start from what we have not talked about, and that is what really gets me really mad. You know, when you look at the seed sector, what, what percentage, uh, Joe, Joe DeVries, what percentage of African farmers are using improved seeds or hybrids? 20%. Now that's that's in yeah, East that's Africa. Only in corn. In corn. And only in corn. Yeah, yeah less than 10%. Yeah. What percentage of irrigated agricultural land in Africa? 3%. Sub Saharan Africa 5%. 2 5 or 2%. 2 Sub Saharan Africa. Asia, 46%. Latin America, 60 something percent. Yes. <sighs> and uh, fertilizer, 18%. 18 kilograms per hectare, sorry. Yeah. Roughly. Some say 13. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Asia? 50. 90. 70, 80 70 plus. And about, yes, yes. And Latin America, about 160 kilograms. So, so you see, so African agriculture, in terms of productivity, is operating at about 25 to 40% its potential. Okay? Simple, traditional technologies. Huh? as old as the Nile civilization. Improved seeds, irrigation, and fertilizer. Now, what is, the, what, is the, uh, what is the only factor that determines whether farmers will use or not use any of this? It's the policy environment. If I give a farmer all of these things and say you can double and triple and quadruple your yield, does she have a market? Does she have a road to the market? And if she overproduces, is our price guaranteed, or is it going to crash? What happens to our produce? Leave something no, no. for you. So, for your no, so the, that, that's it. Okay. So for me, the problem is it's, <laughs> it's so simple. Okay. It's inputs and policy. Okay. Inputs and policies. Usha? <laughs> um, to add to what Kanayo said, I would say um, there needs to be a, a concerted effort to engage with the private sector. Of course. Uh, you missed that. <laughs> so give me an opportunity, Kanayo. Um, but I think private sector, not just for seeds, but uh, you know, earlier there was a discussion about uh, solar panels and irrigation. And, mm -hmm. and India, for instance, now a majority of the farmers have uh, solar water pumps. Mm -hmm. So because electricity is not guaranteed, and so having the solar water pump allows the farmer to irrigate the crop when they want uh, and as needed. So, but, and most of those panels and the pumps come from private sector. The government provides a subsidy, so it facilitates. The second point I would say 
in addition to engaging with the private sector, for the private sector to operate, they need some level of certainty in terms of the facilitating environment that policy. the government. Policy. Um, uh, beyond <laughs> policy, uh, you know, policy exists, but then if it's not implemented, then it's a problem. Mm -hmm. And so uh, some level of certainty uh, for them to operate. Mm -hmm. And I support Kanayo's um, seed input as a critical factor at this stage in Africa, where availability and access to good seed is extremely low. Uh, in majority of the crop, uh, corn maybe is a little better than other crops, but in other crops, it's a it's a major issue. So, mm -hmm. Raj, uh, well, I'd say first and foremost what Usha and Kanayo are saying, and what <laughs> it's Agnes's job to lead, which is, you know, a clear uh, pathway forward to drive up agricultural productivity in Africa, and. It's, we, we humor ourselves with the, the micro debates within that, but there's a broad consensus on what it takes to deliver that. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's well known, it's proven, Agra is proving it, it is an important part of the mix in bringing that to the forefront. And it is politics and inputs and investment, all that, but, but it's this drive towards four tons per hectare. Uh, I love having a quantitative goal because it focuses the mind mm -hmm. and it, focuses the resource expenditure, uh, I think that's the single most important thing. The, mm -hmm. the two other objectives I'd, I'd note are, uh, we haven't talked much about animal protein and, and mm -hmm. protein, but uh, as it pertains to climate change, sustainability, how an African population, hundreds of millions of people that go from $2 a day to $10 a day, how mm -hmm. they choose to consume protein mm -hmm. will have mm -hmm. a lot to do with the mm -hmm. future of sustainability mm -hmm. and health outcomes. And, and that's, uh, there's a lot of opportunity there to mm -hmm. leapfrog the way we in America, for example, mm -hmm. choose to consume protein. Mm -hmm. And I'll leave it at that <laughs> for mm -hmm. now. And then, and then finally, I do think the data revolution is a transformational opportunity. I think we're just scratching the surface mm -hmm. on what it means for agriculture and many other sectors, um, but, uh, but it's gonna create a set of opportunities that uh, will uh, allow and unlock more commercial investment and more rapid economic development for uh, people who don't have to be stuck in a poverty trap any mm -hmm. longer. And we're just beginning to figure out what some of the examples of success in that space are. Agnes? Thank you. Um, I would say institutions, and that goes to policy, functional institutions. It goes to, to what you said about policy and, and what we, we believe in and dri are driving in Agra around improving governance of the agricultural mm -hmm. sector. So, so that's, to me, that is really critical, functional, functional sectors that, uh, that are able to mobilize the resources but are also able to drive the right policies. Then <coughs> one of the things that we, where we find ourselves really getting stuck is markets, functional markets, and maybe that relates to private sector. Mm -hmm. uh, for, to me, a farmer who has a market will buy fertilizers, will mm -hmm. buy seeds. So, so the lack of functional markets is becoming, is, it becomes an increasing challenge for us. The last bit, and something we haven't talked about, is how we start thinking about labor productivity and using mm. African youth and women more productively. We have a huge labor force that is not productive. And <coughs> once tapped into, this labor force can, can be. So, so there's a lot to do, but again, we have to come up with a f list of priorities, and, and, and I think uh, if we get institutions right, we get markets right, and we get how to make our youth productive, we will mm -hmm. get these things moving. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're, the, the panel's in violent agreement that uh, inputs, policies, private sector, uh, government, <coughs> certainty, the clear pathways to driving and scaling up programs. Um, the love the wish we had more time to talk about the animal protein issue and diet diversity and the impact that that will have in con on on the food systems when you talk about what's on the fork, or how it drives what's on the farm. And the, 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 I, th I think the institutional, uh, the changes that are necessary 
you, you all agree to, and I so appreciate, Agnes, you bringing in the issue of women. Because yes, we need labor productivity that includes youth and women, but without equitable opportunity for women, uh, we will not see the progress that is necessary for the continent to feed itself, for any of the countries on the continent to feed themselves, or for the, us, the agriculture systems to achieve that trillion dollar opportunity. <coughs> this has been, I hope you agree with me, uh, a, a fascinating discussion that we could go on for the next hour. I have at least two or three more questions. I know I want to ask, and I saw so many hands out here. We do have a reception afterwards, and um, I invite you to um, talk to our panelists there, because the one question that I didn't ask them that I hope that you will discuss with those here in the audience is why should people here in Silicon Valley care if Africa achieves that trillion dollar opportunity? Those are my questions.